This is the IWA CX-NA555 bookshelf compact stereo system. It dates from 1999. I got this at an uh, electronic recycling place. Someone had discarded it. <clears throat> It's, uh, it's a nice little stereo system that I got for free. The problem with it is the volume knob. When you turn the volume knob, either way, the volume just goes down. So this, this um, rotary digital switch here is faulty. Doing a little bit of research uh, online, it seems that this is a very, very common problem with this device, with this particular model. And I IWA has made a number of very similar models, slightly different, but many of them have this very same problem with that very same knob. So we're going to fix that. We're going to go through it step by step and show you how to do that. Now, um, this stereo system does have a uh, remote control. I don't have the remote control specifically for this device. However, you can use any, any generic remote control that can control audio devices, can co control stereos, will work with this thing. Here's just a general purpose remote and You can control the volume with it. So if you have, if you have a uh, remote that can control a stereo system, it'll probably work with the IWAS. So you might just, you might just do that, but you know, I, I like to fix things, so I'm going to fix this. The next, the next thing is you have to ask yourself is, is it even worth the effort. Well, this was built in 1999. By today's date, that would make it about 17 years old. It's entirely analog. It has a three CD disc changer, three, three CD disc player. It only plays music CDs. It doesn't play MP3 or WMA discs or anything else, just music CDs. And it's got an AM FM radio, which is pretty good and lots of, uh, lots of memory settings. Dual cassette deck, although not many people listen to cassettes anymore. In this day of digital music files, uh, something like this is pretty old school. It might not be worth your while, but if you like to, if you like, if you if you if you have one, you like listening to CDs, you like fixing things. Well, this is for you. Uh, <clears throat> I must warn you, however, that in order to get at that rotary digital uh, switch, you really have to tear the thing completely apart. So it's, uh, it's, it's a bit of effort. Now, um, while I was rummaging around in the electronic recycling place, I actually found a second of this exact model, the Iowa uh, CXNA555. And in both cases, everything worked except the volume knob. They both had the very same problem, where the volume would only go down. So I've got to believe that this is a really common problem. This, this must be the weakest point in the design of this thing, if I got two in a row exactly the same. Now, uh, the two of these are not exactly the same. On the front, they look the same. Um, but... Internally, they are slightly different, and the connections on the back are slightly different. Dates from December 98, 
and you can see the uh, antenna connector is oriented horizontally. The one on the right was built in December 99, and the antenna connectors are oriented vertically. So there's a slight difference depending on when it was built. And internally it's slightly different, but just be aware that what I'm going to do may not be exactly what you see on yours, but it'll be very similar. We're going to tear down the, uh, sorry, I, October, October, the October 1999 one is the one we're going to tear down. Okay, we're going to start the teardown of this thing uh, in order to expose the, uh, the rotary digital switcher, as they call it, uh, the uh, rotary digital encoder, I guess is the more correct name. But in order to get at that, we have to, tear, we have to take the whole thing apart to, to expose that board. Now, um, so it's a lot of work, but you, know, you, can, you can do the whole thing with a, with a Phillips head screwdriver. One tool is all you need. Now, uh, the first thing that has to come out is this, this little piece of plastic here on the CD tray. That's got to come off in order to allow the CD to slide through and out. So that's the first thing we're going to get off. And the way to do that, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to plug it in and then just open the tray. And then we can then we can pop off that front uh, panel, that, that front uh, piece of plastic. And there it is. And underneath you can see there are some plastic. There's three of these plastic clips. You pop those off and then you can get the whole thing out. Okay, this is the plastic piece we're talking about, which has been freed from the CD, and this will allow us to slide the CD player out late, later on. The next thing we should remove is on the back, this little black plug here, this, this piece of black plastic covers the digital audio output. Now that thing has to come off because that's connected to the CD, and again, if you don't pull, it's gonna interfere when you try to pull the CD out, so best to get it off now and just put it someplace safe so you don't lose it. Next, the top of the uh, stereo system needs to come off this piece here, and it's held on with two screws, one here and one here. With those two screws removed, we can now just lift this off in a way, exposing our CD player. The next thing that needs to come off are the side panels. Okay, on each side, these have to come off. Now those are simply held on on the uh, user's left side. That would be a screw here and a screw here. That's it. And on the right side, same thing. Screw here, here, and then one little black one here. And then they will just slide right off. Okay, now with the screws off, these just come right, just come right off. A real look at what's going on in here. Here's our CD player. From the side and on the insides here. Now, <clears throat> the CD player's got a couple of cables here that really need to come off. There's this cable that runs from the front panel. 
Let's just go ahead and grab this one and we'll just disconnect it. Best to disconnect them now. And then there's another cable here. It runs from the power supply. Right here. Just pop that off. Now, as long as we're here, we'll go ahead and disconnect this other end of that cable from the power supply board because that's going to have to come off when we slide off the back. Okay, so now all our, all our cables are disconnected from the CD player. Now the CD player can be removed as a countersink screw here. And then three screws on the back here. One, two, three. And then another countersink screw here. I'll go ahead and slide that in. And then this whole thing will just slide right out. Now with those five screws out of the way, this should just lift right out. And there we are. Now we have a better look at the inside here. Not sure how well this camera is focusing, but our little problem device is right under there. But we're going to have to do a lot of work to get at that. It's on this board here, but unfortunately, this control board is locked into place with all of this power supply stuff here. And that in turn is locked in by the back panel. So back panel is going to have to come off first, which means all of these screws are have to going to come off and all of these three screws along the bottom and these screws holding in the various connectors are going to have to be disconnected. Now all those screws have been removed and we can just Pull this guy off now. One thing to watch for, there is a little, there is a little piece of metal back here, kind of a piece of shielding. Be careful you don't lose that because that'll just fall right off. And there's that uh, cable that we had to di disconnect both ends. You can see where it's sort of fixed in the center there. That's why we want to pull that off in advance. Also, this, this little guy here had to be bent, that little that thing was holding a piece of cable that had to be bent out of the way. Now with all that out of the way, the next thing to remove is all of this board here, which includes the power supply, all of these connectors. <coughs> Got this little countersunk screw here. There's one there and there's two more, one here and one here. And then on the underside, on the underside, we've got two more. Those, those very fine threaded screws there also have to come out. So one, two, three, four, five screws. When those screws are removed, we're going to be easing this board back. And there's a connector here that it's going to separate this board from this board. Um, now there was a there's a twist there was a, a twist tie here I removed a twist tie here just to give us a little more room it was right here I clipped it off because we're going to need that room later on okay I've now taken off all those screws and I've pulled this board back and now it is loose. I just sort of need to fold it out of the way so we can get at everything else. And now we have a clear shot of this board, this control, this board with all the controls on it. Now there's, there's about 10 screws on this thing. 
that have to be undone. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten screws. Now there's a cable here that connects the control board to the tape player. We'll go ahead and pull that out too while we're here. Back on the front, we probably want to go ahead and remove this knob because that's going to have to come out. Now this knob is also connected, but I can't quite get I can't quite grip that one. That's going to have to come out when I pull the board back. Let's go ahead and remove those 10 screws. Okay, now all the screws have been removed. The only thing really holding this board in place now is they have these little gray plastic clips here. Those will have to be sort of bent back slightly, and just gently bent back as you sort of pry the board loose. And that should make it come loose. Okay, I've gotten it. <clears throat> I've gotten the board, the board loose. And here it is. Board has now been separated. Now, one thing to watch out for, be careful of this little part right here. It slides out real easy and you might lose it or not know what it is. This thing, uh, easy to fall out and lose. Anyway, that's kind of a light pipe. So just be careful of that thing. That may come out on you. And you might lose it. And our our knob, the other knob fell out as we pulled the board forward. And here is that board again. There's our display here. And this is our problem guy right there. That's the troublemaker. This is a digital rotary encoder. This is not a potentiometer. It's a digital rotary encoder. You, you, some, you have something similar to that on a, on a mechanical mouse, you know, when you roll it side to side or back and forth. A little wheel inside there, making contacts. Uh, <clears throat> it has three electrical connectors on the front there that, that, that are through the whole, through the whole contacts. And it's got and it has one on either side, again, through the hole, and that's what you solder to the board where those are grounded, those ones there. Um, it also has this little thing in the front there, I guess, to lock it into place, that little thing in the bob there, whatever that is. Now, the shaft of this thing from, from the broad base here to the end measures 20 millimeters. The threaded part of this device here, that's about seven millimeters long. And the flat part of this six millimeter shaft is about 12 millimeters long. And this little piece in the front here, that's about four millimeters wide. Okay, I've done a little more work here. And um, I've done a little searching to see if I could actually find this part. Is it even available? And what I've found is there is a part that pretty closely matches these specs. It's made by Born. And uh, this is the part number, PEC16. That's the part. The The four refers to the pins, the pins are straight down. The zero means that there's no detent. The two zero means the shaft is 20 millimeters long. The F means that the shaft has a flat spot on it. The uh, N means that there's no momentary switch incorporated, which there isn't. The 0024 means that there's 
24 pulses per rotation, and, and there are. We'll, we'll see that when we, we go a little further. And this was available at DigiKey. That's one place I found that was selling those. They were a little more than a dollar a piece. So if you want to replace the part, that part can be had. I, I'm pretty sure that that will be a replacement. I haven't actually purchased it and tested it, though, but it seems to match the specs. Now back to our actual device. There's our troublemaker right there in the middle. Turns out this device can actually be opened up. Oh, kind of lost my focus here. Okay, we got it back in focus. Now, notice there's two little tabs here on each side, here and here, and then here and here. You can actually bend those tabs back. When you do, you can you can lift this top part off and expose the insides of this thing. Now we've got those tabs bent backwards, bent out of the way that is. You know, and then maybe we can just and there we are. Now we said that there were twenty-four pulses per rotation. Well, there are twenty. There are twenty-four. Um, contacts. The way that this thing works when you spin this dial, it makes contact with some pins. There are two, and you see there are, there are two pins on one side and one on the other. These pins are offset ever so slightly, so when you're turning in one direction, you hit one pin first and then the other. And going backwards, you, you, it's in reverse order. So that, that tells the microprocessor whether, depending on the order of the pulses, whether to turn the volume up or down. Well, I, what's happening here, you know, these contacts, they're just not making good contact anymore. You know, you get a little bit of oxide on the metal. And these, these metal tabs, these are just little metal tabs that are bent and with time, that metal relaxes and it loses the tension. So they don't, they're just not pressing, pressing as hard. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take these little metal tabs. I'm just going to put a little more bend on them. You know, maybe take a very fine piece of sandpaper and maybe take off any oxide, which is on the, on the uh, contact surface. I have gone ahead and bent those metal contacts a little bit, putting a little more tension on them. So when I close this thing back up, it'll make better, better mechanical contact. Okay, now I've gone ahead and I've gone ahead and uh, Put this back together, and I've, I've, I've bent those tabs back together, sealing the thing up more or less. <clears throat> that, that was sort of the poor man fix. I mean, the if this were something important, if this were something of value, I probably would have ordered a replacement part. But since this is a 17-year-old analog stereo system with really not a lot of value and I really you know I I've, I've sort of gone all digital myself I mean I don't really listen to CDs anymore myself so we are now going to piece this thing back together again in reverse order that we took it apart in and we'll see if we got a good fix now just uh, one other one other note you know this that part number that I provided you with. Now that this is the Iowa CX uh, NA555. Now you might have a similar but slightly different part. So be sure to check if you want to. If you're going to order one of those, be sure to check your measurements to make sure that 
you've got if you, that you've got exactly the same one. I don't know how well this is going to show up, but here is a uh, here's a uh, PDF web page of that part where it's talking about that that Born's digital encoder. And that's how we figure out our part number there. And these are kind of the dimensions of the thing. Pretty well matches what we have on ours. Hopefully that shows up. Okay, so we're just quickly putting this back together. The board has been remounted. You got to sort of pop it through these little plastic tabs. Uh, and we have uh, put our, our 10 screws back in and we have and, oh, we have and we have to reconnect our cable to the cassette player. Okay, we got this audio output board put back in. I, I previously I, I misidentified that as power supply. Actually, this is this is power supply here. That was stupid of me. Um, but this is basically your audio output board. But anyway, the point is it's been put back in. Uh, the tricky part is getting this this headphone jack over here to to to, to line up. When, when, but once you get that, once you get everything lined up, get that connector lined up, and push it all back together. Okay, got our little countersunk screws, and underneath we have those two other screws. So that's back in place now. Okay, I've gone ahead and put the back on. Three little screws along the bottom, and then these four screws here holding on the uh, the uh, audio output connectors. Also, I went ahead and connected this. This connector here. Went ahead and it's going to be a lot. It's a lot easier to, to connect it now than once you put the CD on. Then you have a lot less room. It's a lot harder to work. So I just went ahead and connected that CD cable. And, and don't forget to put the uh, that little metal shield on the back where the uh, audio ports come out. Okay, we've put the. CD back in and connected it with the three screws along the back and the one countersunk screw on either side and we have put that little plastic piece on the front so that it locks into place and we've put the two knobs back in as well. And on the CD we have reconnected those two cables we took out earlier This guy's been reconnected, and that guy has been reconnected as well. Okay, side panels have gone back on. Left panel with two screws, and a right panel with two screws on the back and one on the side. And now we have put the top back on. just the two screws and we have put our little plug back over the uh, the digital audio output and, that, and that's it it's it's put it's all put back together now and now it's plugged back in let's power it up and the lights come on that's always a good sight and let's make sure our CD player, okay, that slides in and out as it should. Now, <clears throat> let's check out that volume control, see how it works. Uh, look at that. That's the way it should work. Volume control knob is now working normally. So that's the poor man fix. Good. 
again now this is a this is the uh, this is the Iowa CXNA555, but you know, Iowa made a whole bunch of these, uh, all of them slightly different than one another. If you're having that volume knob problem, this video might help you as well. Your, your machine will be slightly different, but, but you get the idea.